<laughs> then I would say, let's start. Then, hi everyone, welcome to the uh, third lecture on requirements engineering today, covering um, the requirements engineering approaches. Uh, today we are going to give particular an overview uh, of a reference model we are going to use also for the remainder of the course. With today's lecture, we are entering the second thematic cluster focusing on the engineering and management of requirements and uh, are introducing an artifact-based uh, reference model and explaining what artifact orientation eventually means. And we are using this one for the remainder of the engineering-centric uh, lectures with a particular focus on the next three ones, but we will we'll be concentrating on the um, elicitation uh, of uh, requirements, so how we actually start a project, uh, but then also on the refinement and specification of requirements according to the classes we have introduced in the last lecture, primarily functional requirements and non-functional requirements. So before we start, let's recapitulate what we did in the last lecture. We have focused essentially on two major discussion points, one of them being the introduction of elementary core activities and requirements engineering to guide the elaboration of requirements over different levels of abstraction. We have discussed um, a lot the, um, the symbiotic relationship between the problem space and the solution space and that requirements engineering ideally at least is always a continuous back and forth between both. We have then concluded with a brief discussion, at least, on the challenges in practice, um, rendering the analysis and the refinement of requirements over different levels of abstraction, at least as we would like to see them from a more theoretical point of view, rather cumbersome. And this is typically reflected in the organizational reference models or software process models, which we will see also today, um, largely neglecting uh, requirements engineering as a discipline and covering them, if at all, only implicitly. And this has consequences at the project level um, as project participants, the people carrying out the activities, the engineering activities have no clear guidance. They have no clear reference on how to do uh, requirements engineering, at least in a systematic um, uh, way. So one of the solutions we have at least touched upon is um, artifact orientation, that an artifact centric um, approach to requirements engineering would be the, the solution, but we have left open what artifact orientation uh, is and how we can use it in requirements engineering. And this is exactly in scope of today's uh, lecture. We are covering three major questions. We will be answering uh, why available standards uh, covering software process models, but also requirements engineering standards are insufficient for what we call an explicit requirements engineering. We are discussing the principles of artifact orientation and what this really means and what an artifact is after all, before then introducing uh, one approach for artifact based requirements engineering, the MDIA approach, which we will be using um, in this uh, course. So, uh, as always, a small disclaimer. Um, we will be discussing today the fundamentals. There will be quite some topics that go a little bit beyond the scope uh, of requirements engineering and beyond the scope of this course. Um, and we will be introducing also, of course, uh, certain things that you might not be using in your project. And this is perfectly fine. What we will be doing today is covering the more fundamentals and um, what the general notion of artifact orientation is and what MDIA is, but how to use it pragmatically and efficiently in your project is in scope of the lab sessions and the project Q&A sessions. So the three questions are reflected by the three uh, topics of today. Uh, first, software process models and how requirements engineering is reflected in them. And then we move on to the topic of artifact orientation, what this means before then concluding uh, with a brief overview of the MDIA <clears throat> approach. So let's directly start with software process models. As indicated in the last lecture, um, we have seen that requirements engineering uh, ideally, in an ideal world, is always something iterative and integrated. What does it mean? Iterative uh, means that uh, requirements engineering is always a continuous back and forth between the problem, spa uh, problem space and the solution space, which means that at some point I start identifying my stakeholders, I start eliciting maybe their goals in a workshop, um, I start uh, analyzing the operational context of my software system, trying to understand the context, <clears throat> I play around with first maybe solution ideas, what this actually means, what implications we have, uh, on 
potential solutions. Maybe I specify some information processing model, very much depending on the family of systems we are envisioning. And then, of course, uh, defining and describing the requirements, distinguishing between functional requirements, non-functional requirements, and so on. Now, back and forth means that um, with every problem statement, I narrow down the space for potential solutions. And with every design decision I take, I narrow down the space for potential further requirements. One example we have at least briefly discussed is the uh, symbiotic relationship between security and accessibility. Now, for example, if I take a design decision to implement a certain um, technology to facilitate a little bit more the accessibility to a software system, this may uh, potentially have some implications on, on further security requirements. So rendering it a little bit more difficult to implement some um, security requirements and of course the other way around. This is the reason also why we try to front load some efforts into requirements engineering, which means that we should, you know, uh, halt, uh, put some thoughts into the actual problem, trying to understand the problem in its breadth before uh, then jumping too quickly into solutions. And this is what you can see on the right side of the figure. Um, at some point I need to be able to grab into the solution um, start maybe modeling, uh, sketching some first architectural ideas, starting maybe with some design and implementation, and then all the way back uh, using continuous feedback loops into requirements engineering, what these solutions uh, um, designs and what the design decisions, uh, what implications they may have on my requirements and using those to further requirements, the requ uh, further refine the requirements. So this is what we mean by this continuous uh, back and forth. And this is, of course, uh, more the theory. This is an ideal world, and this is not necessarily reflected always in practice. As we have also discussed already in the first lecture, that the understanding how requirements engineering should or should not be done has uh, much to do with what we call the organizational culture, among them how requirements engineering is reflected at company-wide uh, software process models. So those process models that they take um, as an orientation. Very often we find requirements engineering as something rather implicitly captured in software process models. And this is typically the case when I work in an agile way, at least when I take the agile uh, software process models such as Scrum um, as is out of the box and really follow only the guidelines provided in these uh, reference models, which means that I jump too quickly to solutions. So in and an agile way of thinking. I typically, of course, work with requirements. I write them down, uh, but then I jump directly as fast as possible to the solution to deliver a uh, minimal viable product. So this is the, but it, this is not only um, one of the major issues in, in agile uh, uh, development, depending on how I interpret agile, of course, but this is something uh, rather typical uh, for software process. Those models. This means that an implicit requirements engineering might, of course, talk about requirements, but there is no explicit uh, analysis of the requirements. There's no explicit refinement over different levels of abstraction, classification into functional, non-functional requirements. There's no explicit integration into a software process model that makes clear the refinement relationships between the different artifacts. And very often there are no clear responsibilities, roles, responsibilities, and many decisions are even shifted to other roles as we have, as we have discussed in the first lecture, for example, uh, developers. One simple example is the banking sector or finance sector that is full of regulations, that is full of of business rules um, on how to calculate, for example, interest rates, how to calculate um, or how to do an, a risk assessment. And this is all part of our, what we call domain knowledge on anything surrounding the software system. Um, and if I shift the decisions uh, to my solution space and, and if I shift the responsibilities to developers and don't put focus on understanding the context of a software system, um, uh, one of the implications might be that very often these developers are the ones to, uh, who have to understand how to calculate interest rates and how to do a risk assessment instead of having a clear understanding specified in a requirements specification. Now, an explicit requirements engineering means that I have an explicit definition of elementary core activities to requirements engineering for analyzing, refining, classifying requirements over different levels of abstraction that have a clear artifact model that dictates how to specify the certain contents, how to distinguish between the different requirements classes, and so on and so forth. Now, if I want to define such an integrated and 
explicit requirements engineering, um, given that I want to integrate it into something, in this case, a software process model, we have to follow the same rules of software process models. But what is a software process model? Now, a software process model describes a systematic engineering approach that guides setting up and executing a software development project with all the necessary artifacts, roles, milestones, activities, and so on, to solve a particular class of tasks in a repeatable manner. Now, the last part of this definition means that I have one central reference model that I use and reuse across different projects. This is what we mean by reference model. I can use it for uh, the development of one particular class of systems, for example, uh, embedded reactive systems or information systems, you name it. Now, um, one thing to understand about software process models is that there don't exist so many standards, more than we can cover in one lecture, of course, but not that many standards, but many, many different organization-specific interpretations. What it means is that I cannot use a software process model as is, out of the box, but it has to be typically integrated into a larger organizational context and adopted to the needs of the different projects. Now, what you can see here in the figure is just one example from a German um, standard software process model, one process model that is intended to be used for all public uh, IT, governmental IT development projects. And the um, reason I'm putting this figure is just to show you what the breadth of such a software process model can be, covering um, the overall project creation, the instantiation, uh, uh, including contracting issues, but also setting up a project, including project planning, uh, the planning of quality assurance, and so on and so forth. I'm saying this because typically when we hear software process model, we tend to focus on the smaller issue only, on the actual way of working um, in the development, but there's much, much more to it. Now, to define a software process, uh, we need to cover different aspects. So here in the definition, we see necessary artifacts, roles, milestones, and so on and so forth. So what belongs to a software process model? The, the minimum I need to specify a software process model is covered by four essential questions. So number one is what is in scope of my development? So what artifacts or work products do I need to create. So for example, a requirement specification, a test specification, test plan, an architectural design description, all these things. So all the elementary outcomes of a software process. Next to it, I need to cover the how. So how do I need to work? This is covered typically by an activity model that defines the way of working, all the steps that need to be carried out in my development project. The third element is the role model that defines the roles and responsibilities. So who is responsible for which activity and which artifact? And number four, the actual when that allows me to define some temporal order uh, in my project execution, typically uh, encompassed by a set of uh, phases uh, and milestones. So, uh, and other than that, we also try to define or typically define in a software process model how these phases are interwoven with each other. I can do this in a more uh, plan-driven way in a more, in a more sorry, uh, waterfall-like uh, approach or in a more iterative approach or iterative incremental approach and so on and so forth. This very much is uh, in scope of the actual process model uh, or the, you know, the phases and how these are defined. Now, another thing uh, that we have eloquently translated from Germany with, with the terms with which, uh, here uh, we mean um, that every software process model typically has also some supporting material like documentation templates or tools that they can use to specify the artifacts or to do some project planning. Now, every project instance, so every actual project that needs to comply with the software process model, which means that all the activities I carry out, all the artifacts I produce, all the roles I assign and all the tools I use needs to be reflected in this software process model. So note that the other way around is, of course, not true. Not everything that is dictated by a software process model has to be done in a project. And this is the reason why I always tailor the software process model at the beginning of a project. In our case, for requirements engineering, when working with the MDIA model, the artifact model for uh, requirements engineering, we also have to tailor it. This means that we have to remove all the elements that I don't need for my, um, for my particular project. Now let's go back after this very small excursion on software process models and start talking again about requirements engineering. What do available software process models have to say about 
uh, requirements engineering. Now at this point, uh, I was not really sure if I just sh should show you a couple of different software process models and discuss them from the perspective of requirements engineering, or if we should maybe together discuss one example a little bit more in detail. Uh, the outcome of this reflection was that we will be doing both, uh, but not today. So in the extended slide set, you will find a couple of examples that you can uh, check. This is just meant to be a little bit more of food for thoughts. And the following, however, we will be discussing just one prominent example. And you guessed it probably, uh, in this case, it's Scrum. Now, uh, only a very small note uh, here, um, Scrum is in the very near sense, at least if you talk with process engineers and those people really working with software process models. In the nearer sense, it's not really a software process model, but it's more a set of principles and philosophies and, of course, uh, artifacts and way of working. It covers all the elements of a software process model, but it has never been really intended um, uh, as a software process model as much as it was intended as a set of best practices. Nevertheless, uh, Scrum has become a de facto standard for a particular class of tasks that fulfill certain prerequisites. Uh, and this is also the reason we will be covering Scrum in this course. Now, let's together discuss. So one of the prerequisites that I need to fulfill in order to make Scrum work is that I need to be in constant exchange with a customer. This is one of the very basic ideas and philosophies of um, Scrum. Now, what I would like you to do is the following. Consider the following mindset, which is uh, one of these pre prerequisites for Scrum or any other agile uh, development methodology. Consider the statement, having an on-site customer, which means being able to constantly communicate with my customer in a Scrum project is fair enough and therefore no explicit requirements engineering or explicit definition of artifacts, roles, uh, activities, refinement, things like this is necessary. Now, what I would like you to do now is check just for five minutes, but please check the Scrum guide and elaborate how requirements engineering is organized, even if only implicitly in Scrum, which means which concepts are used for requirements engineering or for the definition of requirements, where do I find my requirements and what might be missing for an explicit requirements engineering. Now, the easiest way to perceive this and to uh, um, extract this knowledge is just search in the Wikipedia page. Uh, I checked the English speaking Wikipedia page. There you find an overview of all the practices that are reflected in Scrum and all the artifacts. There's a good overview. So I would like you just to take five minutes, have an overview of Scrum, and then let's discuss these questions together. So I would like to make a small five minute break and then I will be, uh, well, I will be back. I will be still here. So please open the Wikipedia and check how Scrum is done. So how is requirements engineering reflected in Scrum? What do we do uh, in a software process model like Scrum uh, to work on requirements? Anyone know? So what are typical requirements artifacts? What do you think? Where can I find my requirements artifacts if looking at the figure we have here? Exactly, both, exactly. In the backlog, in the form of, of user stories. And it's a great way to specify requirements. Uh, nevertheless, um, to, or maybe before doing this, who is responsible then in consequence for the requirements? No, in, in this case, it's the it's the product owner. The product owner, at least I would say, um, is the one closest to the role of a requirements engineer. He's the one to mediate between the customer and the uh, team via, however, in many cases, the scrum master. So maybe it's even a combination of both. And uh, typically, what I what I then would look for is where are the requirements stored and who is the who has the sovereignty of this artifact, in this case, the product uh, backlog. But yes, so typically requirements are specified uh, in the form of user stories. Uh, 
and captured in the product backlog. And from that, uh, I take it as a source for planning the actual um, sprint and, and try to implement those requirements in uh, this respective sprint. But now, uh, are requirements explicitly refined over different levels of abstraction? No. <laughs> Let me give you just in case the answer, no. So requirements engineering is done, but it's done implicitly, which means that requirements are identified, but typically we focus uh, on the most relevant requirements and they, we do not really refine them, but we leave this refinement actually for the, for the sprint reviews, uh, for the sprints uh, and then the sprint reviews where we discuss rather the solutions rather than talking about the, the problem. So requirements are not typically refined, uh, requirements are typically not really classified into functional requirements, non-functional requirements. And very often this has especially uh, implications on the handling of non-functional requirements that are very often retrofitted, uh, sometimes even discovered towards the end when we just notice that the solution fulfills the functional properties that we had intended, but maybe not the non-functional uh, properties that we had intended um, uh, originally. So there are a couple of things things missing other than that is for example the the overall context information think of the example in the banking sector um, this is not in scope of scrum it is very often done when people use scrum but it's not part uh, of the actual reference model and the process description of scrum itself so scrum is just one example as i mentioned uh, there are many many more but they all share these uh, common denominators uh, which is that requirements engineering is typically, if at all, uh, only considered uh, implicitly, but in most of the cases, it's largely ignored, which means that uh, they don't give any guidance on how to elaborate requirements over the different levels of abstraction, how to refine them, how to classify them, and so on and so forth. And further uh, questions typically in scope of software process models are not answered from the perspective of requirements engineering so for example what are the roles the responsibilities what are typical milestones in requirements engineering uh, what are typical activities and of course the artifacts so all this is not in scope uh, of the uh, reference models of the software process models and um, i would even argue this cannot be really in scope uh, because this is rather subject to the domain specific interpretation so in any case, the implications are the same. The standard processes are insufficient to guide an iterative and integrated requirements engineering. Now, if the software process models don't give us proper answers, what do uh, requirements engineering standards have to say? Now, uh, requirements engineering standards, we have quite some. Uh, there are many of them available. Um, but one thing that they all do is they focus on the artifacts, okay? And they do this in different forms and interpretations. One such example for a requirements engineering standard is the one provided by the ISO, the International Standardization Organization, in this case, in the form of the ISO standard 29148. Uh, as a small remark, I'm doing this now for more than 15 years and I cannot remember all the numbers, so please uh, don't worry, you don't have to remember them as well. So this standard, however, defines requirements document templates, and it does so in the form of three different artifacts that are specified as a requirements engineering standard. We have a stakeholder specification, we have a system requirement specification, a software requirement specification. We won't go too much into the terminology and what this really means, but uh, what they do is they provide an outline of the artifacts to be considered um, and saying what has to be specified. And one of the good things about these requirements engineering standards is that they at least implicitly um, consider the different uh, levels of abstraction that we have discussed in the last lecture. For example, they say at some point we need to specify our stakeholders, which you can see here on the left side. We need to discuss some goals and objectives. Maybe I have to analyze a business model, underlying business model, uh, related business processes, for example. I have to specify my operational context of my software system. All this, what we have ca captured as context information before then moving on and specifying the requirements uh, structured into different classes. Now, uh, those standards give an outline and they say what to do, but they don't say much about how to do this. So they don't give any guidance on how to specify those different contexts. And in response to this, the community of researchers and practitioners has developed over the many years different other templates that I should at least, or would like at least to 
uh, mention. One of these document templates we have at least mentioned now in the context of Scrum are the user story cards. Now, user story cards are some very helpful means to specify especially functional requirements, not only, of course, restricted to functional requirements, but this is typically the primary scope. And I do so by following a sentence pattern in the form as, as a role, I can achieve a certain thing, I can uh, make use of a certain system capability so that, and then I have the rationale, so that I can achieve certain benefits or values. So for example, thinking of the ATM example from the last lecture, as a end user, I can authenticate myself using a pin card, uh, a debit card and my pin code, uh, so that I can, I don't know, so that I can authenticate myself and so that unauthorized access is prevented. Now, user stories or story cards are typically used to specify user visible functionality, user visible behavior from the end user's perspective, taking a black box view on the software system. And it's not the only way of specifying this user visible behavior. Another example to do so are use cases. So use case is essentially the same, but at a different level of granularity, because a use case also specifies the in intended way of interacting with a software system from an end user perspective. And I can do so uh, by, by specifying several uh, contents, uh, but primarily by focusing on the different uh, interaction scenarios. Uh, we have typically a primary scenario that describes how I intend to and interact with a software system and certain alternative uh, scenarios. Now, user case templates and user stories are typically, as I said, used for the specification of functional requirements, and they are very dedicated uh, on guiding how to specify these, um, these elements. Um, but there's, of course, more to it surrounding it, which brings us to the last template I would like at least to mention, which is the Volare requirements template. The Re Volare requirements template takes a little bit more of an abstract view on the notion of requirement. Um, and serves as a template to document requirements, for example, in elicitation workshops. Here I can specify the number of a requirement, so it gives me a lot of attributes, requirements, attributes that I can use for the spe specification of requirements. Um, I can indicate which type or which class of requirement it is. Is it a functional requirement? Is it a non-functional requirement? For example, a security requirement. I can relate it to a use case. I can provide a description. Uh, I can use it, for example, to specify also my story cards. I can give a rational and so on and so forth. Now, all these templates that we have are very good because they help us guiding the specification of selected uh, items in my requirement specification, but they fail to give us a larger picture for a systematic refinement and a process integration. They do not tell us how to elicit requirements, how to refine requirements over different levels of abstraction, what the relationships are between requirements, and uh, of course, also not how I could integrate this into a software process models. But that being said, we may still use them as, as part of an artifact-based, for example, approach when we have to specify selected um, contents. But more on this also as part of our project Q&A sessions. Now to summarize, uh, while standard processes largely ignore requirements engineering, requirements engineering standards largely ignores all the surrounding uh, software process, which means that those standards that we have focus on the specification of the requirements artifacts, but they don't say much about the surrounding activities, the roles, the tools, any other element that is part of a software process model. Nevertheless, uh, they typically give an outline and at the same time, they don't give any guidance on how to specify the single content items. For example, how to specify a stakeholder model, how to specify a goal model, or how to specify um, functional requirements. Now, one of the consequences in practice, uh, which uh, was one of the outcomes of more empirical studies we have done, is that most of the requirements engineering standards are largely unknown, and even those that are known are typically ignored because they don't accommodate the real needs of the projects uh, towards requirements engineering. At the same time, most of the software process models are known, I assume, because they are typically in scope of uh, university lectures, uh, of uh, practitioners training programs and so on, but even they are mostly ignored, sometimes even faked, which means that very often you will find people out there that say, yeah, we develop following Scrum, but if you look at the artifacts, what they do is something different, because uh, those software process models, at least out of the box as they are, don't really accommodate 
accommodate the actual needs in requirements engineering. So what I mean by that is that there's a classic gap between theory, because what we have reflected in standards and top templates and you name it, and how it is really done in practice. Now, one way to accommodate that and one way to close this gap is by using an artifact-based requirements engineering approach that makes this practical knowledge, this tacit knowledge, more explicit, which brings us to the second part of today. Now, let's start talking about artifact orientation. What do we mean by artifact orientation? Now, uh, in principle, um, at least if trying to paint a black white figure you know, about reality, uh, I have two basic philosophies that I can rely on to define my software process model. One is what one we call uh, activity orientation and the other one is the one we call artifact orientation. Activity orientation also often referred to as uh, method engineering concentrates on defining a software process model by using an activity flow as the backbone uh, or a set of methods. So what we do is we define a set of interconnected tasks, can be a synonym for activities, methods that define the way of working. So what I define here is how to work and in which order to complete my certain tasks. And for every single activity, I can define my roles and responsibilities and the artifacts are primarily defined as input output relationships um, as used in those activities. So everything that I need as an input to carry out the activities, for example, information from the stakeholders, uh, from their goals to, in order to complete the activity stakeholder analysis. Now, they focus on the way of working. Now, for activity orientation and most of the software process models that have been developed origin in activity orientation, having the very first ones in procedural instructional uh, software process models from the 70s, um, actually, um, they have uh, many still advantages, but also a couple of disadvantages. Now, I'm not going to read through the whole table, but one of the things I find always important to memorize is one of the advantages that people tend to think in processes. So we all typically tend to think in processes and it's for much, much easier for us to digest such a software process model if it's described from a more activity centric perspective, which means that uh, imagine some, some really daily activities like writing a to-do list, even there typically you focus on the activities, on the things that you have to do, uh, the things that you have to carry out. And this has of course many implications um, that you can find, for example, in project organization and management, where I define my, my project plans. All these things are typically reflected as a set of activities with milestones, completion dates, and so on and so forth. At the same time, and this is the major problem that these software process models have, they don't scale up to the needs of practice, which means that they are either too vague to capture all the different uh, possible uh, interpretations of reality, or they are too rigid and too detailed and therefore not really uh, usable anymore. Um, and of course, primarily, uh, this is especially uh, important for requirements engineering, they don't give any real guidance on how to specify the contents. If I have an activity that says uh, specify use case model, I still don't know how to specify a use case model. It's quite difficult. Uh, another thing um, that is very much related to this is the missing notion of quality in the artifacts. So think of a use case model. If I have an activity that says a specify use case model uh, and I specify a use case uh, model, I still don't know if it's a good one or a bad one and have also no view on progress control. Um, uh, imagine that you ask a colleague, for example, in a software project, um, hey, Steve, how far are you with the specification of the use cases? And he says then 80%. Okay, can you really check this? It's much, much easier if we concentrate on the artifacts and we take these artifacts and can compare them to some reference models that define some quality criteria that say a use case model should include these things. Then I know if all my use cases are completed at least to 80% or whatever it is. And I also know what maybe potential quality defects I might have. Now, this brings us to the other philosophy, which is called artifact orientation. Now, artifact orientation is built around the very simple idea that the backbone of my my project execution, the backbone of my software process model is defined by a set of interconnected artifacts. So what I do here is I abstract from the way of working and instead of 
saying how to do things. So which activities to carry out, I define which work products uh, I need to deliver and how these work products are related to each other. And based on this centric artifact model, I can define roles, responsibilities. And of course, I can give some guidance by associating different tasks that are necessary to create these artifacts or maybe to run the quality assurance of these artifacts. So instead of saying how to do things, I just say what the outcome of your activities are. But I don't really care of how, on how uh, about how to do sorry about how you actually elaborate these artifacts as long as you specify what is defined in my artifact centric software process model so again we have same as with activity orientation a couple of a couple of advantages and disadvantages again i'm not going through the whole list but uh, keep in mind that if working in an artifact centric manner typically the learning curve is higher than when working with an activity centric um, manner uh, simply because, again, people tend to think in processes. But at the same time, I have a much, much higher degree of flexibility and artifact-based approaches scale up. Now, imagine the situation where you have, uh, uh, where you are in a project with multiple companies. And I can say you are responsible for the requirement specifications, you are responsible for the actual development, and you are responsible for the quality assurance. Now, you might think this is a little bit far fetched. It's not. This is how reality is, especially for large scale software development projects. And if working with an artifact based model, um, I can very much scale up. To the particularities of these situations because i can say i don't care how you work you can work with scrum and you can work with the v model xt i really don't care how you specify the contents and as long as the final deliverable is this set of artifacts that has this set of relationships to each other if you spe specify the requirement specifications and you take care of the quality assurance this is a link that says how these test cases are related to these requirement specification elements so i can define interfaces I can define a very flexible project execution. Much more important than that is that for the specification of the actual artifacts, I can define specific guidelines that are artifact centric. I can say, if I want to specify this artifact, these are the contents that you have to consider. And this is the way how you elaborate these, uh, these artifacts. Now, all this makes, of course, sense because we are quite abstract okay but let's still uh, focus now on requirements engineering so what is the ideal philosophy for requirements engineering and why is it artifact orientation any ideas whatever pops your mind think of the problems we have discussed in the past uh, lectures, primarily three of them. Number one being that requirements engineering needs a maximum of flexibility. Keep in mind that whenever you work with requirements, typically you are at the very beginning of a project. Think of your own software project or of your own course project, for example. Um, when we start with requirements engineering, nothing is really known. So many things are unclear. It's so unclear how you intend to elicit the requirements. It's unclear which different classes of requirements might be, might be important for your software system. It's really unclear how you uh, intend to develop. It's even unclear if you will develop at all. Some projects will end in a make or buy decision and all these things are not really clear at all. And having an artifact centric approach enables us to achieve this uh, level of flexibility. Another thing that we have discussed is very often that uh, is that very often roles and responsibilities are not really clear. Having an artist artifact centric uh, software process model allows me to clearly define these roles and responsibilities for the selected artifacts. And first and foremost, um, uh, one of the major problems in requirements engineering is that we lack a guidance on how to specify the contents of uh, the artifacts and what the refinement relationships are, how to classify uh, functional requirements, non-functional requirements, what this really means and how these are reflected um, in, the, um, in our overall requirements engineering approach. I can use artifact models to make exactly this implicit knowledge explicit by capturing the modeling concepts of an artifact, by defining clear levels of abstractions and so on and so forth. Now, 
At this point, I would like to leave a little bit this cruising altitude and show you what we mean really by artifact, because so far we haven't discussed what artifacts are. And an understanding about what an artifact is and is not is very important because this explains really what I mean by guidance, what I mean by levels of abstraction and all these related aspects. Now, what is an artifact after all? So an artifact is a tentative work product that is produced, modified, or used by a sequence of development tasks. Think of the figure I've shown you of the software process model philosophy. An artifact is always used as an input or an output uh, by a certain uh, development task. Now an artifact has structure, contents in the form of representation, and it is subject to version control, which simply means that typically I elaborate my artifacts over different instances. So I refine my artifact and there's a certain evolution, of course, to the artifacts. An artifact model consists, obviously, of all the artifacts that are in scope of my software process or of work requirements engineering and all the relationship between those artifacts. Now, um, just a small word of caution, uh, in literature, you will find many different terms uh, for artifacts and artifact models, uh, ranging from meta models, ontologies, uh, over taxonomies to um, uh, work products or product models. Um, this doesn't really matter that much. Um, and another thing that you will also find in literature, there's different ways of defining these artifact models. This very much depends on the purpose because some artifact models are used for the purpose of tool integration. So they specify, they elaborate more the, the specifics that, that are captured by modeling tools, for example, uh, and other artifacts, the ones that we are now considering are developed in a very specific way to accommodate software process models. Now, one thing that is here mentioned in the definition is that an artifact has structure content in a form of representation. What do we mean by that? So in principle, we have different perspectives that we can take on an artifact model. So what you can see here are the most elaborate uh, and most important um, perspectives that I have. I distinguish the structure, the content and the representation. Now, what do we mean by that? A structure perspective is what is typically in scope of the standards. Think of the outlines that are given by the documents. And this is exactly what we mean by structure. So a structure perspective says what has to be done in an artifact. So what are the content items that I need to consider in my artifact? For example, a stakeholder, I need to specify a stakeholder model. I need to specify my functional requirements, maybe my quality requirements and so on and so forth. Now, this is something that is very useful because it gives us a very easy to digest view on the artifacts. The content model uh, defines the actual content of those single uh, content items. So um, it defines, for example, in form of checklists. So this is typically in scope of the checklist and the documentation templates, like the story cards. The content is typically captured in what we call concept models because they abstract from modeling concepts and they dictate how to specify these contents. So for example, if I want to specify a stakeholder, uh, which is dictated by my structure model, by this outline of a requirement specification, for example, my concept model says what to be captured in order to specify these stakeholders. For example, every stakeholder has a name. Every stakeholder has a relationship to another stakeholder. They might be in a certain hierarchy between each other. All these things are in scope of what we call the content specification. Now, the content says how to specify uh, the, the, the selected content items, but it doesn't say uh, how to represent them. So uh, I can, every content I can represent in different forms, interpretations. Think of when we discussed that artifacts or requirements have always a form and a contact. Uh, the form is captured as a syntax. This is what we mean by the form of representation. A use case model, for example, can be specified as an activity diagram, but it can be also specified uh, as structured text in a template. The content is the same, just the form of representation is different. And we need all these three views uh, in order to talk about artifacts. When I have an artifact, for example, a document that I print out, it always has a structure, it always has specific contents, and it has a form of re representation. Now, why we distinguish that, I will uh, explain in a second. But here, first, you can see a small example. So uh, one of the examples I mentioned already now implicitly is the use case example. So imagine that you have one content item that says specify use case model. My content model says what this use case model consists of. So every use case consists of one or more scenarios, a basic scenario, some alternative scenarios, 
Every scenario has a post condition and a precondition, and they are triggered by an event, and they include a set of interrelated actions. So user actions, system actions, things like this. Now, how I specify this uh, use case model, as I said, is subject to the project execution, very often depending on many factors like the preferences of the stakeholders, the capabilities to interpret these contents, uh, but also your own uh, choice in the very end. It often depends also uh, on, on simple things like taste, uh, but I can represent them, uh, for example, as an activity diagram, which I tend to use to capture very complex information or just some sketch notes uh, when I tend to capture some easy information and all those are then reflected in the actual um, outcome which i call artifact now why do i need to distinguish a structure model and a content model the structure model is the perspective that gives me the, the necessary flexibility the content model is the perspective that gives me the necessary precision in my uh, contents the structure model is something that I can easy digest. I can define a structural properties of my artifacts and I can use them for the integration into a software process model. I can say, for example, <clears throat> that my context specification uh, should be done by a specific role. So you are responsible to specify these content items. I can associate milestones to them. I can say this has to be elaborated until this specific point in time. The content model gives me precision because I can tell you this is the way that you have to specify the stakeholders. Um, and this is also what we use typically for this, what we call seamless, seamless refinement and specification over different levels of abstraction because my content model also says how these things relate to each other. Now, one analogy that I like always to draw to explain the difference between content items and uh, concept items or structure model and content model um, is to compare it with an advent calendar. Now think of a, an advent calendar. I'm not referring to these, I'm not referring to these cool ones that have little packages, 24 packages with little presents. Should my wife ever see this recording? Yes, this is a hint. So this is not uh, the cool ones, but you know, the printed ones where you have a, a, a figure that you are printing on a cardboard. Now think of this advent calendar. It's a small cardboard with a figure and 24 little I don't know, windows or doors, de depending on what you take. Now, um, these windows are the content items. These are the outlined elements that I have to consider during my requirements engineering. For example, at some point, when beginning a project, I might have to specify my stakeholders. So I open the first little window and that says stakeholders in it. I open it and what I see is an excerpt of the content model. And this content model says how to specify my stakeholders. The next day, maybe I would like to do my first elicitation workshops to talk with the stakeholders. So I open then the little window that says goal models. So I open that little window and it says every goal should have an ID, should have maybe a specific class. There are relationships between the goals. Now, and it also says there's a relationship between the goals and the stakeholders. So I can go even further and say, okay, I have my workshop where I need to specify my functional requirements. So open that little window and it says I can specify functional requirements in different ways. I can use a usage model, for example, what we will see next uh, in two lectures. Uh, I can specify use cases, I can specify functional requirements and so on and so forth. Now, all these little windows give me one small excerpt of my content model. And more importantly, they also dictate how these things are related to each other. I don't see it, but it's there. I don't see the whole content model, but it's still there. And typically when you have these advent calendars, you can, you can rip off the front page with all these little windows and you see the full picture. This picture, this content model, what you see on the right side is not usable. It's overwhelming. It's far too much. When I look uh, and, and start looking for the elements I need to specify my stakeholders, I don't really know where to begin and where it ends. And this is why I need the structure model that gives a structure to this content and says for these um, content item stakeholder, this is the small excerpt that you have to specify. And this relates in that way uh, to my uh, other content items, for example, the system model or whatever I have in scope. Now, these are the principles of artifact orientation. And many of these things are uh, part and in scope of the MDIR approach. Um, we won't need everything. 
this is very important to understand. We won't need everything in this course, but it's important to at least have heard everything one time to know what is actually behind this approach. Now, let's conclude today's lecture with an introduction into the MDIA approach for an artifact-based uh, requirements engineering. Now, what is MDIA? MDIA stands for Artifact Model for Domain Independent Requirements Engineering. And uh, as I have already mentioned in the uh, introductory lecture, um, MDIA consolidates two decades of continuous requirements engineering development and transfer with practice. So I will not explain, of course, the whole picture in detail, but what it shall uh, show or visualize is that there's quite some history to the development of MDIA. It all started with a very initial reference model for requirements engineering called REM. Uh, what we did back then was to take the standards we had, these structure specific standards and extend them with some first initial content model. This was, however, same as the standard, still very domain independent. And what we did then, at this point in time, we started developing very specific, detailed, domain-specific interpretations. We had one artifact-based approach for the development of embedded reactive systems with a particular focus on the automotive domain. We had another the one that we have been developing uh, for the uh, business information systems, for example, for the banking sector. And all these developments we have continuously evaluated with a set of different studies before then disseminating them to our project partners, many of them becoming company standards at the respective companies. Now, at some point, we have had a couple of different, very domain specific, very detailed uh, artifact based approaches and we decided to harmonize all these approaches to synthesize all these approaches and to consolidate what we did over the past nearly two decades and the outcome of this was the artifact model for domain independent requirements engineering domain independent because the artifact based model in uh, amdia is a unification of all these domain specific variants uh, which is also the reason why MDIA will always need adoption. When you start working with MDIA, you have a very holistic artifact model, but you will not use everything. You will have to uh, remove selected content items, remove selected roles and, and simplify it. And it is always a simplification for your specific project needs. Now, MDIA comes with a set of different components. What you can see here is an overview of the components. What we have uh, first and foremost is what we call the basic components. The basic components are all the elements that are necessary for a process integration. So um, following the philosophy of artifact orientation, the artifact model of MDIA is the backbone of the whole approach. I have a very detailed, elaborate content model that uh, dictates how to specify the actual contents. And I have a structure model distinguishing three main artifacts. One is the context specification, the other one is the requirement specification, and the third one, not in scope for our course, is the system specification. And I use this structure model for the purpose of process integration. I can define several, several roles, responsibilities, uh, I can define a process model that I can associate with a single artifact and so on and so forth. And there's a further set of supporting material, including, for example, a customization approach or tool support and so on and so forth. Also, this layer will not be in scope uh, of our uh, course to keep the things as simple as possible. Now, um, the artifact model, as I had mentioned already, many of the figures I have been using in the introductory lecture uh, come from Amdaya. So the artifact model uh, combines, as I said already, the structural view and the content view. The content model abstracts from proven uh, modeling concepts. So those methods and description techniques that um, were uh, um, um, rated as useful in practice with our company partners and integrates them into one holistic uh, model. Another thing that is important to understand, MDIA is also rooted on a very clear system System model. This is also the reason why we have the system specification as part of MDA, even if it's not in scope of requirements engineering. What we want to make clear is the uh, clear transition from the problem space to the solution space um, built upon a clear system theoretical model that describes what a system is, what is in scope of, of a system, so what an architecture is, how the notion of components may or may not relate 
to, for example, functional requirements. This is why we have this more comprehensive picture in MDIO. And the structure model, as I said, distinguishes these different artifact um, types. Now, one of the core principles of MDIR are the separation of concerns by the different levels of abstraction. This figure you have seen already in the second lecture, uh, where we distinguish the context layer, so anything surrounding my software system under consideration, my requirements layer, where I, where I specify the, for example, functional requirements, non-functional requirements over different levels of abstraction, and then my system layer, again, which is not in scope of MDIR. Last but not least, the process elements and the role model, which I have shown you in the overview uh, of the components are uh, visualized here. So every uh, artifact, the context specification, requirement specification, system specification has at least one role with certain skills that are necessary with certain responsibilities. The context specification and scope of our role we call business analyst, uh, supposed to be a domain expert, the requirement specification in scope of a requirements engineer, um, which serves the purpose of mediating between the business analyst and the third role, which in this case is the system architect. How you call these roles uh, and which persons are assigned to the roles is of course subject to the project. Typically, we unify both roles by associating the same person to both roles. On the right side, is the what we call process model in MDIR. Here we focus on milestones. We have for every single artifact an entry milestone uh, and an exit milestone. The entry milestone says that um, my, my entry chapters, my entry content items um, are sufficiently mature to mature to enter this full specification or the specification of the remaining parts of this respective artifact in full and the, um, the respective exit milestones, the context specification accepted, uh, requirement specific, uh, specification accepted and so on, just indicate a point in time when the artifacts are formally accepted in a project and are therefore to be considered, considered reliable and more importantly, liable. Now, I know this is a lot of information and um, there are many accompanying more academic articles. We have uh, uploaded two of those uh, um, manuscripts in Canvas. This is for those of you who are interested in knowing really the underlying model, uh, the article on the right side, uh, which introduces MDIA. It's quite thick uh, and it explains this whole you know, view on the concept model, everything that underlies MDIA. This is not a mandatory read. This is only for those of you who are really interested in understanding better what is part of MDA and what is not part of MDA. As I mentioned earlier in this course, we will be, will be taking a little bit more of a pragmatic view on this, which means that we will be focusing on this more simplified uh, overview of MDA reflected by the structure model and captured in this pictogram. We will be, we'll be using this uh, also in the remainder reminder of the um, uh, of the course when focusing on the engineering of the selected concept item, uh, content item. Sorry. And here again, as indicated earlier, we will be focusing um, on the first two uh, artifacts that are meant to reflect the problem sp uh, space. Uh, keep this in mind, but this is not in scope of requirements engineering. Now for the next lectures, we will be discussing selected content items. We'll be discussing uh, in the next lecture, the elicitation of requirements, uh, requirements, focusing on what a stakeholder model is and what an object model is, for example, uh, sorry, objectives model is, uh, what the goals are and how these relate to the different further elements covering uh, function requirements over different content items and non-function requirements over different content items. Now, to make MDIA usable in this course and for you and your projects, we have elaborated two things and you will find both things in Canvas. Number one is the MDIA cheat sheet. The MDIA cheat sheet is something that we have written in order to provide an easy entry, something very accessible into MDIA that describes the very essence of it. Everything that is really important and uh, something that is subject to further reading are part of other uh, manuscripts. Uh, we will explain here the artifact model um, in the form of a small glossary, something that you can always take uh, in, as part of your project, uh, just to look up uh, what this was, what that was, uh, a cheat sheet. Uh, 
Uh, and then the second thing we have elaborated for you are the MDI documentation templates and Canvas will find the three templates, the context specification, the requirement specification and the system specification. Um, what we will be doing along the rest of the course is that you will use those specification templates and adopt them and tailor them to your specific project needs and then work on those templates to create the requirements specifications also as part of the assignments. How to do this is then subject to the project Q&A sessions and the lab sessions. So in this case, I would like you to ask you, have a look at the cheat sheet, have a look at the documentation templates, let that sink in a little bit. And then we meet again in the project Q&A sessions and discuss any question that might come up and how to adopt it to your specific project needs. Now, with this, I would like to come to an end of today. Thank you very much. It's time for questions. You would, uh, you would need to adopt two things. So um, you will be able to work in an agile way using MDIR. This is, uh, I'm very happy for this question, by the way. So, because I forgot that. You will be able to use MDIR in context of Scrum. But uh, you will have to adopt both. You will have to adopt MDIR and you will have to adopt Scrum a little bit. Um, instead of documenting only user stories, you will have to document a little bit more, uh, uh, also as part of the product backlog. Um, in my company, we used Scrum, but we also used MDIR, uh, which means that before actually starting working on the product backlog, we captured parts uh, of the context information in a separate artifact. So one additional artifact, the context specification. And then for the product backlog, we captured a little bit more than just the user stories. We captured the functional requirements as part of user stories. But in addition to that, we also specified non-functional requirements. So this means that we adopt a little bit Scrum to fit the, um, to fit the artifacts captured by, by MDIA, but we also remove a lot of I don't want to say waste, but I, I remove a lot of content items that are dictated by Amda because I don't need them in Scrum. For example, there's one uh, very large domain model that I tend to be able to specify in the form of business processes. I don't do this when I typically don't do this when I work with Scrum. So there's always a way between both. So what we would like to do in this course is to actually try to accommodate Scrum but how to do this, uh, I would really like to discuss jointly with you where we can put MDI on the table and how you plan to work and adopt it then. But it's possible. And it's done actually in, in many company specific interpretation. Keep in mind, Scrum as it is defined out of the box is never really used as is. There's always some adaptation. You will always find you know, non-functional specifications. Many projects define a very large data model upfront before they talk about the user stories in more detail. So this is what, what we mean by company-specific adoption. Very good question, very important uh, to, to consider uh, in the course, yes. Any further questions? If not, then I would say thank you very much. So, and keep in mind, uh, in the next lectures, we will be focusing on the selected content items um, and, and uh, release a little bit the density in the, you know, and the lecturing style. So thank you very much. Take care, everyone, and have a good day. Bye-bye.